Hello everyone, I'm Jyotika. I welcome you to my channel Excelling Psychology. This is the last part of my video lessons on the Angry Doodling Study, which is a part of the CIEAS 9990 Psychology Curriculum. In the first part of this lesson, I have explained the study as per the syllabus requirements. The first link in the description box will take you to that video. In the second part of the lesson, I had evaluated the study as per the syllabus requirements. The second link in the description box will take you to that video. In the third part, I had discussed how you can prepare the study for paper 1 of the AS examination. The third link in the description box will take you to that video. In this final part, I discuss how the candidate should prepare to attempt paper 2 of the AS psychology examination. I have already covered all these parts on my blog in a single post. My blog is called excellingpsychology.blogspot.com. Those of you who learn better by reading can skip this video and visit the blog. As you can see on the images in front of you, there is not only text on the blog I mentioned, but there are also illustrations for you to review the material you are reading and to remember better. If you are planning to watch this video entirely, let me tell you that I have based it completely on the lesson in my blog. So if you want to open that and keep it in front of you as you watch this video, that might be really helpful to you. I have added the blog lesson as the first link in the description box below. Coming to the video now, in this video I will be explaining how you need to approach paper 2 of the AS examination and how you can prepare it for this particular study, the angry doodling study. You need to watch this video only once, that is the only extra time you need to give and then you can use the lesson on this blog to prepare for the examination. If however, you feel the need to review some part of this video again, you can come back to it or look at the transcript of this video that I am attaching as the third link in the description box. You can even keep that in front of you as you watch this video. All the suggestions that I make in this video for attempting the paper are in accordance with the assessment guidelines on page 10 of the CIEAS 9990 psychology syllabus and moreover from my study of the specimen mark schemes of past examinations and the candidates booklet of model answers released by the CIE. The links for the syllabus and the specimen papers are included in the description box below. Why I am referring to my answers that I discuss in this video as suggestions are because first I am no authority on the answer papers and more importantly there is no single right or wrong way of writing any answer in the paper. Candidates have been given the freedom to adapt their own writing style. Besides, most questions also give you an option to write, say, any two tasks out of all that we used in the study. So as long as you don't lose sight of the response criteria presented by the CIE, you are free to write in a way that is comfortable to you. I am going to present an approach that is the best in my opinion. I will be discussing some sample answers in this video after a very brief discussion of the nature of paper 2. Unlike my discussion of the specimen paper in my previous lesson, how to practice for paper 1 for this study, I will not discuss the specimen paper in this study. This is because for, for preparation of paper 1, I wanted to show you how all types of preparation from those of individual research papers to general methods are important. For this paper, paper 2, however, as is explicitly mentioned in the syllabus, the entire paper is based on research methods. Yes, you do need to know your individual research papers here, but you need not describe or evaluate them. You have to merely connect them to research methodology throughout the paper. In working terms, this means that you first complete a thorough preparation of the research methods presented on pages 19 to 21 of the AS 9990 syllabus and then practice applying these methods, their identification and application, followed by their evaluation in terms of strengths and weaknesses to every study that you have anyway prepared for paper 1. 
Yes, it is ideal to first prepare for paper one completely and then prepare for paper two. I'll give you a brief, a very brief this illustration of this preparation here. Once you've prepared your lesson on research methods and the Android doodling study for paper one, you can then start preparing for paper two. First, identify all the components under research methods mentioned from pages 19 to 21 of the syllabus. You must have already done most of this for paper 1, but just cross check. Then think of an alternative of each method that could have been used in the Android Doodling study, such as another sampling technique, another research method, etc., that could have been used. After this, evaluate the merits and demerits of each research element that was used and that could have been used. Again, this will overlap with your preparation of evaluation for paper 1. This might seem to be very exhaustive, but as you keep practicing in this way, you will realize two things. One, not every element could be applied to every study given the nature of research questions. Two, there is a lot of commonality between how elements could have been used for different studies. The Andrew Doodling study was a lab study. If you practice converting it to a field experiment, you will find that you can convert even other lab studies in similar ways to field experiments. So application will become easier and easier as you practice. Now in this section, I'll discuss with you a few questions that could be asked from the present study. I have created these questions as samples and you can create many more such questions yourself if you take the specimen paper as reference in the way I've highlighted just before this. Let's start looking at sample questions. My approach is to focus more on how the answer was derived because the material for the answers I've already explained in the first two parts. Besides, I'll also discuss some common mistakes that candidates make by answering questions. Something very important here, if you feel that you need more time to read the questions and answers on screen, do make use of the pause button. We begin by looking at question 1a. Though we can see that very obviously this question has been derived from the doodling study, we should treat it like an unseen question. Otherwise, we will either not read the question carefully, assuming we know what it is, what is being asked in it, or we will answer whatever we have memorized for the doodling study. Now we'll see a sample answer on the screen. I always emphasize understanding over remembering that is how your syllabus is structured. Make sure your answers reflect your understanding. What is one tail and two tail? Remember directional and non directional hypotheses. If not, you need to revise your basics. Here's a poor answer to this question on the screen one which indicates that the candidate is not clear on her understanding of different types of hypotheses nor the study. Plus, the candidate unnecessarily refers to the study in the answer. Take a look. A reason must be given, not just for the sake of giving a reason, but one which actually makes sense. Okay, we look at the next question now. This is the second part of the first question. We are looking at the questions one at a time since this is a presentation. But is this how you will approach the question, people? Please don't. Do read all parts of the question before attempting the first part since all are related. It should not be that because of the way you answer the first part, you are not able to answer the remaining parts. Okay, we'll read the question now. Remember null hypothesis, the hypothesis that makes a prediction of no significant relationship? If not, you need to revise your basics. 
We'll read a specimen answer now. This answer is very direct. There is nothing to be discussed about it. We'll read a poor answer now. Your statement must be very clear, not left to interpretation. Let's read question 2 now. You might wonder how this question pertains to the Andre Doodling study. It does not. It has more to do with your ability to evaluate research methods. But once you have studied the Andre study and other laboratory experiments, the answer to these questions will come to your mind quickly since you have studied so many examples of the given methods in the form of these studies. So now let's look at an answer. Both these points are true of the Android study as well since it was a lab experiment. The question that comes to candidates' mind here is whether they should illustrate their points of difference with specific studies. But this question you should absolutely not do that because that would give unnecessary coverage to a two mark question and going overboard with the length of the answer can lead to negative marking since it deviates from the given command term. Here in place of stating two points of difference you would end up describing the differences. Do focus on command terms when you answer the question. Coming to question 3, let's read it first. Here we need to just recall what the sampling technique was in the study and then state a demerit of the sampling study, of the sampling technique, not the study. Let's read the answer. Since we are using the study only for identification of the method, we are not evaluating the sampling technique of the study per se. So we will not make any suggestions regarding its appropriateness to the Andre Doodling study. This is something we would see in an incorrect answer. Coming to question 4a now, it's about validity. When we prepare the evaluation of any study, we definitely note points regarding its validity and reliability. Since the Android study was a lab experiment, we have seen so much about its validity in its controls, design and data analysis, so I was able to easily pick up two points as you see on the screen. A mistake candidates make here is to confuse validity and reliability. Make sure you know the difference between all these concepts clearly. Loosely speaking, validity has to do with the purity of results. Reliability has to do with their consistency. Sometimes candidates believe that stating some controls is enough to explain validity as if controls and validity are the same thing. You have show exactly how the controls provided for validity. Remember that the command term is described, not state. A small reminder here, if you feel that you need more time to read the questions and answers on the screen, do make use of the pause button. Question 4b is the converse of the previous question.
If while evaluating the study you have prepared for the weaknesses well, then this question will be easy to answer. We are just stating one way in which the study was not valid. We are not saying that the study was not valid. Keep that in mind. You can see a mistake candidates often make on the screen now. This is a classic case of confusing reliability and validity. Question 5a is on the screen now. Again, this is a type of question which calls for a generic understanding of basic statistics, not related to the study. You can see what needs to be written in contrast you see between an appropriate and inappropriate answer on the screen. I see a need to reiterate here, avoid taking your answer beyond the scope of the command term in the question. Do read the question carefully before answering. Let's read the second part of question 5 now. Identify involves simple naming, no, no elaboration whatsoever. I'll reiterate here, do not elaborate unnecessarily in an answer or you will end up defining the command term and lose marks. The question asks for identification and not description that we see in the poor answer. Let's read question 6 now. I have seen candidates who assume that example refers to hypothetical examples that they must conjure. Please understand that examples must come from the research studies in your syllabus. The specimen answer I am now going to present is incomplete. Please note that. The reason it is incomplete is that we need to present examples for both quantitative and qualitative data. Since our lesson is limited to the Android study, I have not illustrated qualitative data with any study. Also, for such a question in the paper, you are free to use any other study for your illustration. I would do prepare such questions for every study so that your understanding of every study is prevalent. The answer is on the screen now. Do take note of the answer's clarity and precision. One question I have been asked by many candidates here is that the mark scheme points out the different examples of methods or techniques can be used here. The specimen paper or mark scheme points out the different examples of methods or techniques can be used in terms of either studies or techniques or methods. Why I recommend using studies as examples is that the candidate is well prepared in terms of actual practice with them. When it comes to say using Likert scale as an example, candidates make mistakes because their clarity in them is lacking so they have not practiced the understanding of these techniques in depth at this level, level standard level.
since they understand this technique only superficially say that Likert is a 5 or 7 point attitude scale, they cannot describe it enough to use it as an illustration. If however you understand the technique very well, do make use of it as an illustration here. Another question pertains to how many examples should be used. This is something I discussed in the previous paper 1 video as well, but I'll make it more apparent here. I'll show you how using too many examples makes the answer look memorized rather than understood. Take a look at your screen now. Depth is always preferable to breadth in mid to high level command terms. We read question 7 on the screen now. Though we are expected to be brief here, we are also expected to give a definite answer just like we see on the screen now. What you need to note is that I have presented a definite plan of action, not a vague one with several possibilities that we now see in an incorrect answer on the screen. Our answer should reflect our knowledge of measurement techniques that we have seen in so many studies of the syllabus. Coming to the second part of the question now, which looks into our ability to evaluate a hypothetical study. We are asked to explain one problem here. Not any problem, a problem with the way Alice is measuring attentiveness. That is, we should reflect whether there is any problem with the validity of the measurement method. Let's see a specimen answer accordingly. Sometimes candidates point out problems in their answer which are either not connected to the problem or they fail to show how the point is relevant. For example, see the answer on the screen now. While the point of subjectivity of interpretation is relevant here, the candidate should have explained explicitly how the subjectivity would lead to a poor judgment of the attentiveness of candidates. This is not apparent in the answer. The eighth question is on the screen now. Please make use of the pause button if you need more time to read. Now this question is a straightforward one though we are not required to merely state but identify. Keep rushing up your command terms from time to time. Here though our answer must be restricted to the example presented. We can clearly see that the example has been formulated from the Andre Doodling study. So we can use our preparation for that study to easily identify the variables in the given example. Accordingly, now we read a sample answer. All I've done is first point out what the dv was and then state it is in operational terms. An incorrect way of answering the question would be to confuse the independent variable with the dependent variable.
An important side note here, always highlight the chief points in your answers to increase their readability and to keep yourself organized as you write the answer. An infrequently used common term is seen in the next question. Name. Naming involves simple identification and that is what I have done. Though there are two sentences in my answer, the second is not explanatory. It only states the first statement more specifically. A poor answer here would defy the command term by engaging in explanation. There is a third part to this question too that we now see on the screen. This is the part that asks for an explanation. Okay, now what would happen if we had already explained our answer in the previous part itself? Then this answer would have become a mere repetition of the previous. That is why it is necessary to read all parts of the question and more importantly, restrict the answer to the scope given by the command term. Let's look at a sample answer now. Do contrast it from the previous answer. See how naming is different from explaining. A poor answer here would fail to give a clear explanation as you see on the screen now. Which performance would not be comparable? Why is it so? Your answer should not produce a host of questions in the mind of the examiner. There's yet another part of this question that we'll see now. In the answer, I have used counterfactual explanation. We should know that the weakness of one method becomes the strength of its opposite method. Ambiguous answers should be avoided at all costs. In yet another part of this question, we are asked for an explanation. For the command term explain, in particular, we are asked to showcase our understanding of the material. Therefore, there is no room for ambiguity in the answer. You can see this in the specimen answer here. Coming to question 9 now, we'll read the question first. Here again, we'll analogize what we've learned in the Android study to the present hypothetical scenario. There's nothing much to explain here, so we'll proceed. Next is the lengthy 10 mark question that many students fear. This is better read on the blog that I have prepared this presentation from. The blog whose link is in the description box below. I'll present the answers here briefly and discuss some important considerations here. 
do make use of the pause button. Organization is the key to essay answer writing. Make sure you have enough practice of that before attempting such a question. Let's read the question first. In the answer that I present now, I want you to look out for the content and readability of it in terms of how relevant it is to the question asked and what is the kind of elaboration that I have made. Actually, there is quite a bit that can be discussed here given that this is perhaps the most challenging question in both papers combined, largely because it is unseen. Nonetheless, there are specific skill writing that you expected to use that will help you score well. I'll just list these out, trying to be as comprehensive as possible. Always point out specifically how you will use a research technique for the given question. Like I have illustrated in the answer that you just saw. Do remember you are not being asked what a research technique is. You are not being asked to explain the method of participant observation here. You are being asked to apply your knowledge of the method to a given question. You cannot lose sight of this objective while answering. The question is how, not what. Next, you must be very clear in your answer. No ambiguity at any cost. You do not have loose ends saying something like interviews should be taken. It is not for the examiner to decide what should be asked in the interviews or what materials to use. It is for you to write out. And that's how we ensure your ability to apply. Interviews should be taken is something that you have read in theory. So it seems like you are just reproducing it. How are you applying it? While practicing your answers, review them after writing. Ask yourself, does this answer show that I can apply the specified method to the given problem? If not, find the areas that need more detailing and then revise your answer. Third, be very organized and this is something that will simply not come without practice. If you give the procedure first, then something about sampling technique, then something about the aim, as and when you remember what to do, what do you think this conveys to the examiner? That you have absolutely not practiced your answers. The answer is disorganized in your head and that is why you are disorganized when you are writing. That is why I insist on practice rather than repetitive reading. Your exams are in writing. How will reading based preparation transfer to a written exam? If you were a real researcher, could you afford to make a report anyhow in whatever order you wanted? You are being prepared for real work in your curriculum, so you have to work accordingly, not just to pass the exam. Also, giving headings and subheadings is very useful, not only to make the answer easy to read, but more to keep yourself on track. When you practice with headings and subheadings, that is in terms of sections, you are able to divide your answer into sections while writing in the paper. That way, you do not miss any section, plus you don't sabotage the, answer, the order of your answer. You know exactly what you need to cover. Lastly, take note that you cannot omit sections of research papers as per what is comfortable to you. Your answer must have a beginning, a body and a conclusion, which for such report-based answers means that it must start at the aim and end at the conclusion with sampling, procedure and other details as per the nature of the research method in between. Many candidates argue here that since the research has not been conducted, it is not possible for them to give a conclusion. 
just as without the research being conducted, you are able to get the procedure and other details in terms of how they should be carried out, you can get an idea of how the conclusion can be drawn. This discussion is in actuality quite exhaustive to cover here, but I have highlighted what is most important. Besides, whatever rules apply for essay writing answers will apply here as well. Now coming to the second part of the last question, which should be easy to attend if the first part has gone well. It is still found to be difficult by many students. Let's read the question first before discussing further. One aspect I would like to discuss here, which I want you to pay special attention to, is that many candidates somehow believe that they should deliberately make an error in designing their research in part one of the answer so that it, they can attempt this part of the answer. In fact, in some schools, teachers are promoting this practice. Read the question carefully. You are being asked for the limitation of the method applied by you, not the way in which you have applied the method. So you have to construct answers from your knowledge and practice of the weakness of different research methods and provide an alternative for the same, not discuss your hypothetical inability to apply the method correctly. You can look out for what I have just said in the answer that is now on the screen. I have raised the issue of the reliability, which is the limitation of any observation that is used and then linked it to the specific question presented to me. As an alternative, I have suggested using multiple observers. I have specifically explained how this technique of multiple observation can be used, not simply named it as a possible solution. When you study the weakness of different methods, you should simultaneously study the ways of overcoming these weaknesses to be able to answer such questions. Anyway, discussion of how to study research methods is beyond the scope of this lesson. Also, I have just completed the discussion of my specimen paper. Consequently, discussion of this part of the lesson is over. And since this part was the final one, I have just finished a thorough discussion of the angry doodling study entirely. I have completed the entire lesson now. Okay, so that's the end of the four-part lesson of the Android Doodling Study. I hope this lesson has been helpful to you not only in preparation of the Android Doodling Study, but also in getting a detailed idea of how to prepare for any research of the syllabus. Now, what do you do as the learner after watching this video? I strongly recommend creating your own questions, looking at the different requirements of the syllabus and writing them, not orally, but in writing. Such an exercise will help you very, very, be very, very confident about answering the exam paper. Also revise the lesson by attempting different questions from all sections periodically to assure yourself that you can easily attempt the study in the paper. Thank you so much for taking your time to watch this video. Do visit my blog for this lesson and many other lessons relating to psychology. The link, as I've told you, is in the description box. If you want to know more about me, the information is on my blog. Besides, if you have any questions about this lesson, you can ask me right here or in the comment section on my blog. If you have any questions relating to psychology, you want some explanations of concepts or have some career-related questions or need some help on personal issues, you can contact me on Quora. I keep answering such questions there. Again, I'm posting the link in the description box. Do not forget to like this video if it has been helpful. Do share it with your friends looking for help in their preparation just like you. And do subscribe to my channel for more such lessons in the future. See you again soon. Goodbye.